Lower Decks Season 5, Episodes 1 and 2. For the last time, welcome to the Cerritos Season Premiere! Hey, it is Dr. Trek! Larry Nimichek coming at you here from the heart of Trekland and letting the dust settle just a bit on all the new Trek headlines. So instead of a hot take or a quick take, you get a second opinion from Dr. Trek. Hey, I have been writing, editing, interviewing, archiving, meeting, observing, commentating, dot connecting, and yeah, fanning Star Trek for um, a while now. And I just want to say, hey, dos decis, cinco de treco. Okay, okay, sorry. Hey, listen, finally, though, we are back with some new, fresh second opinions, mainly because we're finally back with some new, fresh Trek. You know, it seems like ages since, what, disco ended? And even more so because usually Lower Decks had always premiered a week or two after Trek Vegas in August. So it's felt even more. But here we are. Our fresh Treks are, are rationed now. And that's partly due to this two-episode Tendi arc, right, that opens the season. I'm glad it's a two-episode story. I, I was glad to see it not wrapped up so fast. So in the big picture with two, it's like we wind up getting a trope show and a half to start things off. I mean, you got the Mirror Universe show, but without all the daggers and goatees. So it's more like more like a Voyager duplicated show, right? Without the silver blood. And then yes, the second episode, 502, is Shades of Green off of Shades of Grey, you know, from TNG, infamously. Fortunately, with no live action clips to pad it out, but with that title, you know it's going to be all about Orion. The best thing is, it's not all just about Orions. We get one of those Lord X goes meta Star Trek stories. Put a pin in that. But yes, it's a new season. And for those of you keeping score at home, the opening title, Space Battle, hey, it's getting even more crowded. Now we have V'ger, we have the Whale Probe, and an Apollo Force Field Hand. So as we dive in, we're doing two episodes at once here. So kudos right off the bat for episode one for Dos Cerritos. First of all, to writer Aaron Burdett. Uh, for one thing, it's not Mike McMahon himself writing the open episode. Hmm. Right? Now, this is Aaron's second Lower Decks after he, among other things, invented Moopsie last season for I Have No Bones Yet I Must Flee. And he was a co-executive producer all last season, now bumped up to EP. Meanwhile, the director here is Megan Lloyd. She was a storyboard artist for seasons two and three, and as we saw, got bumped up to directing. She did three last season, including I Have No Bones. And I'm betting she may likely, well, this may be the first of her three to direct this season. And then with 502 Shades of Green, the writer is Keith Fogelsong. Now he had been a, a, a producer on live action Bones, among his other credits. But he comes to Lower Decks this season as a co-executive producer, and this is his first writing credit for the series. And then our director on 502 on Shades of Green is a name you'll know, Bob Suarez. He's now done 10 episodes uh, across all the seasons, except for third season. And he also directed 10 on Mike's other series, Solar Opposites. Okay, little things, big things. Let's jump right in with 501, right? Dos Cerritos. This teaser, it's so much fun. With a collector like Paler Toff, right? From the most toys. Only this guy, he's like a young version. It's fun to see all the Easter eggs there around the around his collector's room that we get. I don't know though. I think the most the most fun deep cut is all that TOS looking rent house ancient statuary. Uh, also, Mariner trying her darndest. To play a good game of Vulcan Calto, you know, Vulcan chess, and being interrupted. Oh, and another little thing, but very cute, Tendi, in disguise, is wearing a hollow emitter as a locket. Instead of, you know, the surgical alteration for her guys, she's just hollow emitting, looking like a Hollyan, right? Not surgery. 
I guess you just can't keep a good future technology down. But I loved his TMP phaser. Uh, little things. Sweat stains on Rutherford. H have we ever had animated sweat stains before? Oh, another little thing. Fleet Magazine. <laughs> now, I think that's supposed to be a nod to the official Star Trek magazine, which, you know, is bittersweet now that Explorer has announced that its last issue is this year. But did you notice he's holding issue number 47? Oh, little thing, apparently. To brig is a verb. Who knew? Oh, big thing. What Lower Decks is doing, once again, for the Orions. I was so thrilled last season with watching Lower Decks actually, actually get to be the canon positor, the canon explorer for things like, for big picture cultural things like the Ferengis. And yes, the Orions, thanks to having an Orion in your regular cast. And here, once again, what they are doing for Orions and the Orions. I mean, when those double doors opened and those goofy helmets came spilling out, I literally scrawled in my notes, oh my God, I love it. And then the whole thing about stitching up Orions and Orions, you know, not just, not just the blue-green division there. I always thought they were just light toothpaste mint green, you know, still green, easier to smooth the cannon. I mean, who knew they were blue? Okay, but not just resolving live-action Orions and uh, animated series 1974 Orions. <laughs> not just that, but also Orion history. This reference to the ancients and to their old wars and to a medical barge. Because remember, they were, they were excavating the Orion medical ruins. Dr. Corby was going through old Orion medical ruins for vaccination inoculation technology that the Federation could use even in Kirk's time. And now we get this great plague of Orion, which might explain why their hugely advanced culture was big, did a big reset, right? Because that plague would have been, oh, I don't know, about the 2000s here on Earth, right about now. And then jumping into 502 in Shades of Green, the actual Orion title, we solidify here that Orion, well, it's organized as the syndicate is the governor, right? And it's made up of great houses, like, like the Klingons have. Oh, little things. I loved it when Boimler sat down on the sci-fi cycle backwards, because that's always what the hell I'm thinking. I, I love them picking up on that. I mean, sci-fi cycles, they're so unfronted. Oh, little things about 502 Shades of Grey. It is such a great biology show. And did you notice it has everything from wing slugs baked into rolls and blazards? Oh, that thing is such a blazard. It could not have been called anything else but a blazard. And then all the way to a, a coma beetle. Oh my, <laughs> what is that? Oh, one more little thing about Orions. Apparently, thanks to Kirit Kita's line, they were in a real war just 20, 30 years ago. Uh, she says her mother fought at the Battle of Therat. Is that a city? Is that a planet? I don't know, but it was a real deal. And yet I have a question from 501, from Dos Cerritos. The opening teaser. Are those Hooperians that are the guards on the collector's ship? You know, Hooperians, like my Hardu that was the manservant to Grand Nagazek. I believe they are. Okay. Favorite line. Yes, yes, yes. In 501, in Dos Cerritos, I love, no one deserves to be swapped out against their will. Oh, and then in 502, even more. In Shades of Grey, nebulas are full of dangerous tons. There are a lot of tons in Star Trek. Oh, and a runner-up, um, again, from 502. It is possible to do everything right and still Get your 018 kidnapped by corporate elites. A nod to Picard's famous line, who saw that coming? Oh, oh, and stupid rich kidnappers in their tacky hideout, i.e. a mansion. It's about as helpful secret as Section 31 wearing a black badge. Oh, and finally, Boimler, when he's holding the dying Mackler. Turn away from the mountain. 
didn't say anything about the koala. Okay, cast and characters on both these episodes. Hey, Eric Bauza is a voice actor. He was the voice of Yorif, the collector, right? Paler Toff's people. He's voiced on both of the animated uh, series and very short treks too. In fact, he was the short Denobulan uh, Barnus Frex over on Prodigy. And also among the Enterprisians on Prodigy, he was both Scott E and Sul U. So a real member of the Trek family should make him welcome. And then, oh my, this just goes on and on and on. Thanks to this mirror trope on 501 on Dos Cerritos. I mean, I love, I love Shax's ponytail. I love King Billups, right? And the dragons. I mean, you had all the greatest hits of the Cerritos extras and the recurrings. And did you notice, just maybe to help with the sanity, the two-tone uniform colors? Everybody was everybody was slightly lighter or slightly darker for depending on your your home universe, right? I don't know. Was that another meta lower decks move there to talk about why now the live action lower deckers on Strange New Worlds uniforms were darker reds than Born Learn Mariner's normal look in the animated? If it was, it was genius. And then in 502, yes, we've established this Orion government. We have a pirate queen, and her name is Sabor. Is that like a, a green cross between the Ferengi Grand Nagus and the Klingon High Chancellor? <laughs> it struck me that way. What's amazing is it was voiced, she was voiced by Oscar Montoya. Yeah. Who's not only was also Mackler in this episode, but had been the voice of Vexelon, the non-tyrannical planetary AI, uh, last season. Meanwhile, paired up with Mackler, welcome a new Tellarite to Trek, Gorm. Now, if he turns into a barfly, I'll let you know. Oh, and we got Billups here in 501 with all the mirrored crew. Not only do we get Billups and King Billups and the dragon joke, we got the dragon joke extended as a visual. No lines. Burned to a crisp. <laughs> Very Looney Tunes. I loved it. And I don't know. One of the most intriguing things as it unfolded in 501 in Dos Cerritos was Captain Freeman's situation. I was expecting, what, are we going to go here to Shades of Tasha Yar, you know? What am I in the other dimension? And then to find out, it's the Starbase 80 joke but they held it up till the very end, did you notice? We get almost nothing of Dr. Ta'ana in these two episodes. If you listen close in 502 in Shades of Green, you may catch Jillian Vigman as Astrid, the purple-haired member of the Erica and Devana's crew, trio. Goes right by you, but she has some lines. Same thing again, not a lot of ransom, but Jerry O'Connell, got to inhabit the main robot number one at the uh, Targillan mansion. And then Fred Tashator with so little shacks to do in both these episodes, he at least gets to play the Orion captain, Kalevin, and then he's Devana's dad, Bert Tendi. Uh, well, for one line. But at least he doesn't have to go get a pillaging job now. And then everybody's instant late favorite to Lynn, Gabrielle Ruiz here. Not a whole lot in the first one, but, you know, she's there in the background. But this fascinating little subplot here with Rutherford in the second episode, right? I mean, she's filling in a bit, and she's not, as I was worried for a minute, going to replace Tindy aboard ship, right? Meanwhile, when she was re-tearing down the shuttle, did you catch Googie? Googie, as in Badgie's Googie, back helping her? Gotta look quick. So next up in the cast, we want to talk about Rutherford. And I almost think for both episodes, he rather flies under the radar here, especially in the Mirror Show, especially in Dos Cerritos. Because what you have to stop and think about if you let it sink in is it's, it's the awareness of his counterpart, right? His Otherford. Love that. How did we not get that through five years until now? I don't know. But his awareness there of not realizing that Otherford has walled himself off from emotional attachment 
with all that extra tech. And that did Rutherford actually realize here that he's missing Tendy and he's trying to kill himself with too much work to distract himself? I mean, we achingly get that self-awareness. And then, as if to underline that, then boom, in Shades of Green, we get the whole plot about how much he misses her when he throws a fit when Talyn is fixing the poor little Junker Sequoia shuttle. And she, with all the empathy in the world, you would not expect of a Vulcan, destabotages it. And then Bradward. Oh no, let's not forget Boimler's Bointers. I wonder if he came up with that on buffer time. Yeah. Or had he been reading old Enterprise logs and came across Leffler's rules? or even Gibbs's rules. And even in episode two, it's interesting to watch them gradually play this supervising the young ensigns bit. And we watch him develop through that, like last season. They've got to walk a fine line between playing that note once too many, as long as they can find different ways to develop it. And I know it's a comedy, I know it's comedy bits, but they're, they're evolving, evolving the characters here bit by bit. And it's, there's pathos and ethos going on and uh sure i got a kick out of it <laughs> watching him contort with leadership responsibility and then we come to tendy and in both of these episodes especially 501 you really realize she's really stepping into that whole trek uh caught between two cultures character right like spock like wharf like cork and rom even she is a rebel among rebels. It's, it's a nod to doing it both ways, or, you know, the best of both worlds, as it were. You're like, more plundering, less killing. <laughs> or her gentle, supportive mutiny, a jutiny. And then, of course, we've got Mariner. Wow. Captain Becky Freeman. Yeah, talk about the roads not taken in all ways. Because, you know, she has her academy mate, same age, who is a captain already, which just betrays how many years Mariner's been self-sabotaging herself, right? And then in 502 in Shades of Green, we get her self-blame at teasing Boimler and leading him astray with his ensign charges so she, just so she can remember and role-play what it was like to go around and then she feels guilty about it, and I don't know. It all answers the question exactly what does a maturing, yet still dramatically interesting mariner need to look like? I'm expecting a lot more down this path this season. Well, and so here we are, last looks, 501 and 502. Yeah, I think my favorite part of, of Dos Cerritos was the arguing over the meta. Arguing over whose universe was really prime, whose universe was really better, right? I mean, it's like it's like Will and Thomas Riker on steroids. That was funny. I can't believe they were able to mine that for a joke, but then again, it does what Lower Decks does best, which is take on a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old Star Trek fan debate and not only make fun of it, but turn it into a story point. They've done that so often. So we have fun with that in 501. And then in 502, the big thing is, and it, it sounds radical to say this, but in the context of our storied and often puzzling post-scarcity 24th century, it's hysterical to have these allusions, you know, to everything from like a bank smelling worse <laughs> than, a, than a veterinarian's office, right? animal cages, and talk about elitist terrorists. I love that. I love that they turned that on. Wasn't expecting that in an episode titled Shades of Green. We slipped that in. So good on you, Mike and company. And then also at the same time, we have the whole, the solar sails crash. I mean, it was right up there with the Voyager timeless ice planet crash. Who saw that coming, you know? Or even in Drive. Or even with the races or much less DS9 and Explorers with the real solar sailcraft. Really cool, really, really good way to pack in the tension. I'm just gonna say, 
Basically, Lower Decks has picked up right where it left off. We're getting the tropey Star Trek meme shows that are, they, they feel so familiar, and yet they're, they're taking things at a different, a kilted angle. And all the characters, all the characters, as much as we could cram into two episodes, and there, there are at least eight more episodes with these guys and gals. But all the characters are coming along. We're learning new things about them. And Lower Decks is still in the case of well, the Orions and Orions. And even all the other planetary cultures here giving up. I love the t-shirts for the campaign to get, you know, no cash allowed. Lower Decks is doing all the things that no one dreamed possible when it started. It's just bittersweet that we're starting the last season here. I can't wait for the third episode. Can you? Oh, one more thing. Did you notice in 502 Shades of Grey, Tendi's crew's resurrected Orion medical frigate with the rotating fan of an engine on the back with the gold balls? It was rotating slow. Speed it up. And you've got the original spy ship from Journey to Babel way back. All right. All right. Two episodes. One of my episodes. I think this is as good a place as any to sign off on this second opinion. Hey, but what did you think? Here's your chance. Comment below if you would, please. Like and subscribe. Boost the signal too while you're at it. Hey, I dare you to subscribe for some Star Trek sanity. Most of all, if you enjoyed, if you crave more Dr. Trek in our Trekland point of view, I invite you to go over and check out all of our Star Trek, well, webisodes, our experiences, our live streams, the podcasts, yeah, and the Star Trek tours too, and our tea public shop. It's all there at LarryNemichek.com. I even have a cameo shop, did you know? Yes, LarryNemichek.com, and you know what? We'll see you next week. Trek well, everybody. <laughs>